You can hear me back there, right? Yes. yes. You got a hand. Stanley store at the end of our alley had a dead end sign shaped like a diamond set into the ground at the back of the curb, turned up on a point. One of its kind left in the world. Euclid Avenue ran into it. 84th place crossed it. Tootie, Fruity, Freddy, and Ricky Cook pitched pennies on the sidewalk behind it. I raced Kenny Nottingham in a race I regarded as the race of my life, from the blotched beige bark of the big leaf sycamore peeling to within a tag hand's reach of winning, rattling the buttons of glass that covered the sign as I fell to the ground, my hand in the curb, a hand in the mud, my face scraped by the pipe that supported that sign. It was the race of my life, lost, boarded up, abandoned, block by block, purchased and sold. And try as I may not to, I run it again and again, sometimes in my dreams, sometimes while sipping coffee in North Shore ca cafes or on the Gold Coast, when the autumn dusk drops its lavender haze and the electric lights in the buildings square themselves double on the damp streets, making the people I do not know weave in and out of the mist to become the people I forgot to keep with me, walking out of my mind into places that will never be again. Stanley store at the end of our alley, a dead end sign, a pane of glass framing another world, in a race I run backwards, never able to win. Imagine a little kid on the southeast side of Chicago in a bungalow, sitting at a spit piano, doodling with the key. This was the rain. This the thunder. And this, the electrostatic stitches knit now and again in the gray growing darkness gripping the sky. This was the bright blue, the sun, steps of the spider, light on the downspout, beads on the paint flakes, peeling off tin. This was the moon dissolving in a window, wrapping a shade, the passage of air. It moved the curtains, sheer white from the wood sill, wet to the alley, caught in the spin. This was the cry, calling at midnight, voiceless a cry, calling within. These were the footsteps. Someone was coming. No one to listen. No one to care. He was a small boy running from father. He was a father running to son. They were a moment caught in a photo caught in the sunlight, caught in a spin. Here is the green lawn, under the sunlight. Green is the empire, bounded by walks. Here he is running, fast through the red leaves, falling in autumn into a pile. Face of all sunlight, passage through gangways, taken at emergence, emergence to light. This is the bright face, face of October, racing the summer. Indian ghost, and these are the brush leaves, frosted in autumn, frosted in morning, curling at sunset, curling in smoke. This is the lace gown, garment of snowfall, flaking upon him, falling within. He was a small boy running from father. He was a father running to son. They were a moment caught in a photo, caught in the sunlight, caught in a spin. This was the rain, this was the thunder, this was the lightning stitching the sky. Now comes the dark blue, there is the moonlight. These are the stars spinning on and on. These are the stars spinning on and on. Cochran downstairs in the utility room of the first, first Presbyterian Church on West Ads. He had a head like a mushroom. 
a huge petrified mushroom with beady pig-like eyes floating in two spoon <laughs> scoops above a withered cucumber snout, all stuck onto a fleshy beer barrel torso with creamy elongated gourds flapping out the shirt sleeves. I didn't like looking at him. <laughs> and I liked him less when he opened his mouth. He was a bar fight ready to break glass over some petty incident. Look. I can see from the crooked direction of your nose that you've mixed it up a little. Well, don't be fooled. I have to. Push me too far, and I'll push back. Back to the grandstand postures and the two-by-four equalizers that can lay a hunk of human meat down flat with no avenue out. After my nights out there, mixing bad blood, at least I had the sense to twist the bones back into a position presentable for public viewing. <laughs> <laughs> you and your crooked muck still broadcast trouble. It was a testimony to how little we know about life's undercurrent of irony. Cochran and his mushmelon self became my cosmic buddy, my spiritual pilot, my take-home dinner of how one-on-one -on -one can sometimes be raised to the ultimate power and that's okay. Because when the beady eyes soften in their ivory mist and the cut lips turn into a Frenchman's pout, old man Cochran takes on the aura of a grease monkey Buddha. A one-line puncture God can't stop laughing at. He who made the heavens upside down, made the heavens, made this upside down character from time to time almost as divine as the tears running down an old man's cheek. Whenever Cochran and I blooded coffee at the nugget, conduct, discussing the conditions of the universe, the topic always eventually swung back to his kids and the fucked up society he had to raise them in. I could relate. My generation and his went through families and marriages and kids like toilet paper. Wipe it, throw it away. Houses, cars, toaster ovens, families. Cochran's oldest suffered the most. The girls found a way through the mess via their mother, but Buck, the oldest, had taken too many hits. And all the men's, all the money, all the advice, all the after the fact guidance fixed nothing. Cochran watched his life resurface like a beer can bobbing along in a dirty river and he was helpless to do anything about it. Here's one of the dumbest things I ever did. I still don't know what I had between the ears to think that this was something a father should do. I guess I wanted a kid to experience life in a war or some goofed up shit like that. <laughs> it's hard to think back on this. Am I boring you? Okay, it ain't that horrible. It's just one of those things that stick. There's this apartment building at the end of the block. A 12 flat, not a real low down, bombed out bump, but a place where the transients come and go with a few hellos and no goodbyes. It's Saturday morning, summertime. The squads are spinning their tops parked sideways in the wrong direction down a one way street. The wife and the kids are bunched up on the porch with the nosy neighbors trying to get a good look at what's going down. It's bright outside. I remember that like it's today. Big clouds sailing across the blue sky, gorgeous. All of it reminds me of the night a car ran over the fire hydrant in front of the Swedes place. 2 a.m. and the whole neighborhood's out in the pajamas watching the water shoot up like a geyser. Same situation with old Fritz hung himself in the garage down the block. These events put a stamp on it. Anyways, here's what I do on that beautiful day. I take the kid down to the corner to see the transient guy all beat up, bleeding on the stoop. He ain't dead, just drunk and busted up. But the kid, he's six years old. What's he thinking when he's looking at this? I'll tell you what he's thinking. His imagination is thinking, I'm looking at death, and he don't even know what death is yet, but he's looking at it in his head, and whatever instincts he's got about it, death. Six years old, I make him look at it. The fuck was a man? And now you know that ain't the worst. No, not at all. Minor league. 
When he's old, I try to apologize. I'm going to fix it all up, see. Repair the damage, Mr. Fix It. Guess what? He don't remember. <laughs> don't remember a goddamn thing. Lash it off, lash at me. Stuff it. We all do that. Make a long story short, grown up, he's afraid of everything. And then when he gets into the dope and the booze, goes the opposite direction. Every fucking evil shit you can imagine. God help somebody who thinks they know what they're doing. You get what I'm trying to tell you? It's taken me a long time to understand Cochran's logic. I went over to his apartment one afternoon, and there he was in the living room with two sledgehammers duct taped to the ends of an industrial broomstick doing bench presses on the sofa. <laughs> uh, why don't you just buy a set of weights or join the health club? I ain't that type. I don't join things. I don't want nobody looking at my business. I'm 56 years old. I ain't going to be one of those high-class goofs riding a bicycle standing still. My old man croak if he saw me at a health club. <laughs> Your old man did croak. He crowed twice then. <laughs> Cochran's kid is in the music business, a showmaker. House parties, raves, underground concerts. He's busted out a few times, but keeps fighting back. The kid don't quit. I'll give him that. He'll lay down and get depressed for a day like the rest of us. Waste a week away, maybe. Hey, I know you do too, so don't pretend you don't. But the thing is, you can only do that so long. Time runs out. He's 33 years old with nothing in the house to show for it. Hooks up with too many creeps that use him more than he can use them. The kid's generous to fault. Selfish and generous at the same time. A fucking enigma. Here's the latest. He's been up all day for six nights straight. Probably popping bennies or whatever they call that crap now. Why? to put together a CD for one of his low-life buddies who could give two shits about all the work he's put into their project. So fucking stoned, they don't know their own names. I've seen them. They look like trash cans. Smashed up trash cans with legs and arms sticking out the sides. Mock heads hanging off the lids. I wanted to get a good grip on the junk hanging out of one guy's nose Give it a yank and let him know that if he fucks with the kid, I'll lay him down like he ain't never been laid down before. Guess what? The he's a she. A broad big enough to kick my ass with her pinky finger. This is a fucked up world, let me tell you. And these are the freaks he's doing business with. Have you, have you ever looked at the music they're playing on TV? I'm sure you have. You're into all that goofy shit. You call it music. I call it evil. That's right, evil. Look, I've done a lot of fucked up crap in my life. Did it to the kids, did it to the wife, the whole community who so didn't deserve it. But inside, I knew I was fucked up. I had some guilt, however deep I hid it, and it ate away at me until I had to change. Don't be laughing at me. I changed. You wouldn't be sitting here with me if the other guy was back. These shitheads think that the crap they're doing and selling on TV is some kind of answer. That it's okay. An alternative direction. It's fucking evil. Demon shit. The downward path. Hopeless. Cruel. And somebody should stand up and say that out loud so everybody can hear it. Are you following me? Buck and Cochran faced off one night six years ago about taxes. The kid hadn't paid any in his whole life. No taxes. Number five. Not that it made much money, but is that not so? What? What was he thinking? You gotta pay something. They got people working day and night to find the dummies who won't turn in a tax for Cochran goes crazy on him. Tell them what to do, how to do it. The kid tells them to fuck off. And it almost comes to blows. But it doesn't. It just takes on the form of words. Words you can't take back. Mostly out of Cochran's mouth. That's progress.
me at 19 and that guy that called my father home oh, and like that was, I let him go to it, go to it, Bob so the eventual justification for me being a piece of shit the rest of my life. And on that time, the final night, I kept telling him, spit blood, I'm telling him, give it all you got, daddy oh, because when you're done, I'm still going to be here, and you better hope that I got more of a heart in me than you do, fuck it. Let me tell you something. The brutes, they know when it's over, when their turn's around the corner. Ain't no one to lay off and play another angle, pretend that nothing happened. They even joke about it like it was a TV episode or something. And they ducked the bullet. I wanted to give him something different, but I didn't know how. I wanted to show him the red leaves, the fire of autumn, the tall grass, the quiet graves. I wanted to give back the too soon and the too much and the too hard. Give him something else. On January 23rd, a few years back, Cochran went to his first heavy metal concert at a beat up bowling alley on the northwest side. Gothic metalheads wall to wall, some of them very, very large. Inside, Cochran was afraid, and he hated that. He hated their music, he hated the symbols of power they adorned themselves with. He hated the fears inside him, the pulse, the music, the dirty looks, the threatening postures. He stood out like the weirdest dude in their universe. Powder blue jeans, <laughs> a yellow knit shirt, and white hair. He was there to see Buck's latest band, Peeled Skin. And for the past three months, they've been talking without drawing no conclusions, just listening. I just listen. He can say whatever he wants to. His freaked up buddies come in and sit down next to us at the restaurant like it's a drug deal. They say, hello, Mr. Cochran. I nod. They leave. I make no comment after they're gone. I just smile. And here's the thing. I ain't going to make a choice. I'm just telling you, this goes nowhere. I learned not to be this way, and it was wrong. I, I can see that now. But I ain't got that much time to trade, but I'm trying to concede it. So here's the thing. He's up there in this shithole with these fucked up kids dressed like the Adams family, all around sneering at me like Viper. He's up there on stage directing people because he's the only one who knows what he's doing. I can see that. The tech stuff ain't right, and he's up there fixing it when everybody else is chopped off chicken heads. He's my kid. That's what he's doing. And then he starts to play. He's a synthetic thing, you know, with the buttons and patches. Plays any, any instrument, only it's electronic. And he's good. He's alive. He's accomplished. And I'm looking at him through the blue bar light. And I love him. I love him again. I ain't loved this kid for six years. And now I love looking at him in the middle of this hell, and I ain't stopped loving him. I've seen him every week for the past six weeks. Ain't that nice? In the middle of all this evil shit I'm hating, I love him. This is not too far from the truth for all of us. By the time Cochran finished his story, we were both crying. Two old men in the golden nugget, surrounded by 20 other broken <laughs> lives. They've all been there. Al the Greek cook comes over and asks if there's something he can do. Cochran hides his face. I start to laugh. What a sight. Old men cry. Nothing more pathetic. Nothing more real. Hey, pal. You're going to get old, too. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. It ain't no big 